Good morning. Pardon my voice. I'm getting over the junk and everything. So I hope everyone is enjoying this nice weather. But keep an eye out on what's coming. I want to let everyone know that if you need help with anything during the week, please call the church office and our Methodist men will come help you do anything. We're hoping it's nothing, but we don't want to have anybody stranded or anything like that. So call us and let us know. This is what your church family's for. So if you need help with anything, always call the office. All of our wonderful men, even some of our women are more than willing to help you. All right, if you look at your bulletin, the back blue QR code, it's kind of a pain and we're having some issues with it. Um, a lot of y'all, Mr. Mike caught y'all out front to help you register. It only lets you register one person, but if you need help with any registration afterwards, we can help you out there. But the green one with our church calendar, that one is working. So I suggest your little blue connect card that's in the pew, fill that out, put that in the collection plate, and we'll get you registered that way, if you feel so. A couple of little things. If you feel it on your heart that you would love to help Miss Chel Miss Chelsea work with our kids, she needs a children's ministry assistant. It's part-time, you get to wrangle children. It's a wonderful, wonderful job. If you are interested, see Pastor Drew. He can sit down with you and y'all can visit about it. She would love to have you help out. Okay, our wonderful women of Wesley, they are always having such a good time. 9.30, they're doing their new book study. If you need a book or want more information, there's a flyer right outside in the foyer that has all the information about the books and all that stuff, correct? If you ever need anything, Miss Bobby is who you need to talk to. In the classroom? Okay, the books are in the spirit classroom, which is, I mean, you just go that way and it's right there. But always contact uh, Miss Bobby if you need any help with that. Wacky Wednesday, of course, is back. And we had a bunch of people this week. Y'all should see the amount of children that are just everywhere. 5.30 is the family supper, followed by 6 o'clock to 7 is Drew's Bible study, our grief support uh, study. There is so much going on. If you need something to do on Wednesday, come here. Guarantee you it's always good food. So next Sunday, very, very important, one service. Sunday school's at 9, service is at 10, and then we will have lunch. So I'll tell you about lunch in a minute. How many of you have an old Bible that you don't use anymore? You, you, nobody likes to throw away a Bible. I mean, that's just awful. We are going to have a table next Sunday sitting outside with a Bible or a couple of Bibles that people just don't want anymore. You've gotten a new Bible. You have an old children's Bible around. Bring that during the week or even next Sunday and leave it on the table. If you are someone who doesn't have a Bible or yours just isn't what you want anymore, grab you a new one. That is our service to people here. You wouldn't believe there's so many people who just don't have one. So take a Bible, leave a Bible, whatever works. That is our gift to everyone. So bring your Bible. You can bring it on Wacky Wednesday. We will find a home for it. So that is our wonderful thing that we'll be doing next week. So back to lunch. If you look in your um, bulletin, there's rules. If you look at it, you follow, you think of your last name, what letter it starts with. And it tells you what food, if you want to bring something, to bring. Okay? That should be pretty easy. But if you are supposed to bring a vegetable, but you bring the world's best banana pudding, you know who you are. You better be bringing that banana pudding. If you bring the world's best potato salad and you're supposed to bring a dessert, you better bring that potato salad. Y'all got it? I think it should be pretty easy. Do not feel like you have to bring something. If it is just not gonna work out, just show up. The meat will be provided. We just wanna have good fellowship. We want everyone to come one service. Because if you show up at 11 o'clock, guess what? You just showing up to eat and there's nothing wrong with that. Also, it's a great opportunity. Maybe try a new Sunday school class. You know, if you aren't in a Sunday school class, try to go to one. There's a, a flyer that looks like this out front that tells you about each class. You know, we would love to have you in Sunday school. You know, there's lots of fun things going around in this church. If you miss the photo opportunity for our new church directory, two more weeks, it's the 29th. 
just show up at between nine and noon. She will take you, you know, no appointment needed. Grab whoever you need to, say, put your clothes on, let's go. You know, she's here. That's what, we need to get your picture taken. And tonight from six to eight, the pickleballers out here in our court, they play some serious pickleball. You know, we want everyone to feel like they can come and learn a little bit, have a good time, fellowship. I have a feeling because it's getting darker earlier and earlier, that, change, that time could be changing pretty soon. Any questions, always ask Denise or Miss Vicki. They'll be willing to show you how to do it. They have a very well-oiled machine. We will, everyone is always welcome. All right, anything else? Oh, we do, choir practice, right? Okay, the 24th choir practice will be extended. And the reason we're doing that is we're going to start rehearsing Christmas cantata. Okay, their cantata practice. So they're extending it by 30 minutes? Uh, the first part of the, the practice is like 5 to 5.45. Wait, wait, excuse me. From 5.30 to 6.15 would be cantata practice. Okay, 5.30 to 6.15 is cantata practice. Okay, 6.15 to 7 is regular practice. So that's going to be just just now starting this Thursday, Tuesday? The 24th. The 24th. So if you want to be part of Cantata, come early, and she's going to set you up. And it's oh, she's already told me what it is. It's going to be great. So y'all are going to love it. All right. Oh, and also, Miss Lisa McLaughlin would like to ask if anyone wants to help with communion in this service, contact her. She needs a couple of new people to help out with communion. It's very easy. I have a lot of the kids do it in the uh, first service. It's really easy. If you would like to be part of that service to your church, contact Miss Lisa McLaughlin. She would love to get you set up. All right, anything else? All right, let's stand and worship.
as we come to this uh, time of prayer, we have many things on our hearts and minds, and uh, not least of which is uh, Jordan uh, Heidenrich is uh, in uh, ICU in Houston, and um, and that's pretty. Sit- uh, I haven't heard anything this morning, but it's a pretty serious situation. And of course, tomorrow we're going to celebrate the life of Grace Sheffield, who was uh, a member here. Uh, that is at. Uh, 10 o'clock is the um, visitation, and then 11 o'clock is the service at uh, Melanson, Livingston. And, um, of course, we also uh, want to lift up um, Menlo uh, Klingman. Uh, I'm going to see him after church as well. He's He is uh, perhaps um, getting ready to trans- transition to be in lord's hands so we've got a lot lot going on and and i'm sure there are others on your hearts and minds this morning so uh let us go to the lord in prayer most gracious heavenly father we thank you so much for this day and we do rejoice in it and not just because it's a beautiful day but it's the day that you have made but we do thank you for this sun splash day uh two of them in a row it it, uh, that hasn't happened in a while, it seems, that we've just been inundated with rain. But we thank you for the rain as well, Lord. And we thank you for who you are. You're such a God of love and mercy and, um, and grace. Lord, we need you. Um, there's so many folks that are struggling right now, and we've, we've named a few. Lord, we lift up the family of Grace Sheffield and the family of friends of hers and, and as as they say goodbye and uh, Lord we we also lift up Menlo and Jordan and all the people on our on our prayer list um, uh, Lord we know that you care about each of them and we know that you are their great physician we know you're their gentle healer and so we uh, we ask that those arms your arms being the healing arms the arms of the great physician envelop each of these uh, folks that are on our minds, on our hearts, and, and certainly printed on our list. Lord, we thank you that um, we have today to look at the Old Testament, and we see the we see some things in the Old Testament that kind of are like nails on a chalkboard. We don't we don't we don't like to see it, but. There's some tough theological things, Lord, but we're going to tackle those today with your help so that we can better defend our faith when we, to ourselves and to others. Lord, it's it's high time that we we preachers um, tackle these uh, tackle some of the theological icebergs that many of us run into from time to time. Lord, we just thank you for being you. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit here and the presence of Jesus. And we thank you so much for Jesus who lived that perfect life and gave it up for us on the cross. And so that his death is our death and his resurrection will be our resurrection. And that's the great hope, the great assurance of the Christian faith. And we thank you for that. And while Jesus during his earthly ministry before he went to the cross he taught us to pray the what we call the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those pass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever Amen
ushers, please come forward. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given to us so that we have something to give back to you, Lord. Receive these tithes and these offerings as a token of our growing love for you, as a, as a symbol of our desire to serve you and have this church serve the mission field we call Mid County. We thank you, we praise you, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Put your feet in the 
scripture reading is Malachi 3, 6, and 7. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? That the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Pam. Well, um, many, many pastors, including myself, um, sometimes avoid some of the very difficult things about theology. And, and so the, these theological icebergs, you know, we don't want to endanger people's faith, but what we want to do, and what I want to do today, is to help us defend our faith so that we can uh, have a stronger faith, and then in turn, help others too, other Christians and non-Christians, with their faith. And one of the questions um, that I get most throughout my entire career is why does the God of the Old Testament, why does he seem or why is he so different than he is in the New Testament? And so we're going to be looking at that. We're going to do two things. First, we're going to answer that question with the help of Malachi, the, uh, the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, he was a minor prophet, and God spoke through him like he did the other prophets. And we're also going to look at Richard Dawkins, a noted new atheist, uh, um, what, uh, one of my favorite uh, Christian uh, theologians and apologists, uh, Paul Copan calls the new atheist who are very equipped in what they know and so we have to be equally equipped because they have the same stuff over and over and over again believe me I've been in their message boards I've seen what they say and they know exactly what they believe and why they believe it they're wrong but um, unfortunately they're wrong and hopefully some of them will come to faith in Christ but we're, we're going to use a quote, though, from Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. And why we're going to use this quote is because it's pretty much all-encompassing of everything the new atheist will say. Here's the quote. The God of the Old Testament is, is argu arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Well, right there, if you believe this is fiction or man-made and not God-breathed, you're going to be agnostic or atheist. And so that's, that's really the first thing. And so atheists believe this is just written by man, but we know that the Holy Spirit wrote it through man over 1,500, different, 1500 years uh, and 40 different authors. But he continues, he calls God jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully, end quote. That's what he calls our God. So we're going to tackle this today, and we're going we're to uh, shoot down that quote pretty hard. So uh, let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Holy Spirit, I need you to work. And so we, we ask, I ask, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, anoint me so that this sermon, this, this message will bear fruit in the lives and hearts of our people. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, as I said, the way I prefer to tackle this is to first answer the question. Is God the same in the Old and New Testament? Or does God evolve? he change his mind or does he become a little less you know does he just get a little more laid back in the new testament the answer is no god never changes we see this evidence of god not changing throughout the bible however the answer is found uh very plainly in god's 
prophet Malachi. And the Lord speaks through Malachi. He says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So we get, we, get the, we get the answer from God himself. I never change. God never changes. But what else this passage in Malachi does for us, it shows a lot of what's going on in the Old Testament. The Israelites continued to be disobedient to God. Now, not, not just disobedient, but committing spiritual adultery and idolatry. This, these were God's chosen people. God chose these people to form a nation to bless the world with Jesus Christ. And so God is not interested in having moral cancers thrive in his creation. But, and so he wanted to keep the Israelites pure just as if I had a wife. I would want to keep her pure. I wouldn't want her going off with someone else. I would be jealous, but that would be a righteous jealous. And, and when Dawkins calls God jealous and proud of it, he is jealous. He is a jealous God. God. Darn right he's a jealous God. But it's a jealousy that's not sinful. It's not tainted with sin. It's, it's a pure jealousy. These are God's people, and he doesn't want them worshiping other gods, which they did. But every time they returned, as he said in Malachi, right? Every, you return to me and I will return to you. And so there we've knocked that out. God is a jealous God, but it's not tainted by sin. And he is trying to set up a platform so that the Savior of the world could bless the entire the entire world well Richard Dawkins in this quote about how he's how God is jealous and proud of it a petty unjust unforgiving control freak a vindictive bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser misogynistic homophobic racist infanticidal genocidal filicidal pestilential megalomaniacal sadomasochistic, capriciously malevol malevolent bully, this, is, this reflects, friends, how the atheist community feels about our God. This is how they feel. And even though Dawkins couldn't be further off about God, we need to unpack this so that we can be equipped for our own spirituality, but also for others who may be struggling with some of this because there are people that are struggling with some of the things that Dawkins has pointed out in his book, The God Delusion. Well, many of what, uh, many of the things that Dawkins is, is talking about here is, is judgment and how God deals with judgment because he calls him a bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, um, infanticidal, you know, meg megalomaniacal, an unforgiving control freak. Well, in the Old Testament, there, there were judgments. Again, as I said, God was not interested in having moral cancers thrive in his creation, so he always warned of coming judgments. And there's a sign of grace right there. He warned of coming judgments. And each judgment preceded by warnings were often also preceded by lengthy time, lengthy periods of time to repent. Example, Noah and the ark. Well, for hundreds of years, the people were warned before. The, it's not like God got mad one day and said, Noah, build that ark, and within a week, we're going to set sail. No, he gave people time to repent. So this isn't just some this pettiness and God's mad and he's going to get rid of them. Ah, let's 
let's flood the earth and get rid of these people. He gave them time to repent. Many, 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 many years. And atheists will point to God wiping out the Canaanites. This is always a big one. Why would God wipe out the Canaanites so that Israel can have, have their land? Now, you know that this is still going on today <laughs> in the land of Canaan uh, with, with the nation of Israel and Palestine and all of that. It's still being fought over. But you have to understand, this is so important to understand, that God in the Old Testament is the same God. But he's also setting up a nation of Israel, his chosen people, so that the Savior could come in and save everyone who would have the heart to receive, ears to hear, and the heart to receive him. And by the way, God wiping out the Canaanites, he only gave them 400 years of warning and time to move. 400 years. 400 years. I think that's long enough. And furthermore, if there was a presence of innocence, people in the situation or the, the, the situation that w was to be judged or the culture that was judged, God delayed it or stopped it altogether. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. As wicked as that pl those places were, what, it, what happened? Abraham said, are you, are you going to sweep away the righteous and the wicked? And, and, and was told if God could found only ten righteous people in those cities, he would withhold judgment. That's in Genesis 18. God isn't this, this, this megalomaniacal, as Dawkins says, um, God who just wants to, wants to show his power. He has a plan and a purpose, and it's all, it's all grounded in love. Not only did he sometimes delay judgment, but he also provided a way of escape. We see families where many times in the Old Testament were given the option to depart and leave a land uh, being conquered by God's people, but they didn't take advantage of that opportunity and they dealt with judgment. And sometimes even the culture receiving judgment like Jericho had somebody or a group of people that were spared. In the case of Joshua and Joshua 2 in the, in, in the story of Jericho, we have Rahab who was a prostitute who helped the two spies. And the spies said, look, if you... If you uh, do these three things, have your family in here, don't tell anybody about this, and, and put this scarlet uh, ribbon on your, on your house, you'll be spared. And she was spared. And you know what? You know who came from the line of Rahab? A guy named Joseph, who happened to be the earthly legal guardian of Jesus Christ. Finally, we must realize about the Old Testament judgment that they fell on morally perverse, recalcitrant people. And, you know, once somebody is clear that they're not going to repent, um, should God wait any longer? Well, let's look at more of Dawkins' claims. Because a lot of it does have to do with this judgment aspect and this genocidal, uh, these genocidal claims. Is God misogynistic, as Dawkins claims? No, it's very clear. The Bible says women are equal. Of course, they're equal in nature. We see that in Genesis 1.27, Exodus 21.28, to see how they, they are equal in value of life. They're certainly, val uh, they're certainly equal in redemptive status, right? God died for men and women. Obviously, that you can see that in Galatians 3.28. 1 Corinthians 12, there, you can see that they're equal in spiritual gifting, political leadership in Judges 4.4-7. 4, 4 through 7. And, of course, Jesus uh, used women. I think a woman was the first to uh, see the empty tomb, and Jesus um, uh, propped up women in ministry 
uh, as well. So no, God is not misogynistic. This is a silly thing. Now God, um, I do believe God has a certain order that he likes the family to be in. And if you call that misogynistic, well, you know, so be it. I believe the, the husband is to be the head of the household and, and all that. But that, that doesn't say anything about women being less than. But this uh, neo-feminism has taken over America today, and it's, and, it's, and it's just silly. It's absolutely silly. Is God infanticidal? Well, um, no, God doesn't hate babies. Uh, God, God's word couldn't be more clear about his deep love and protection for children, including the unborn, where most atheists are fine with abortion, by the way. Um, God isn't. Um, and, you know, the only children and babies to experience judgment in, bi in the Bible were those who had parents who unfortunately resisted God's calls for repentance or warnings to leave their land. So, no, God is not infanticidal. Another silly um, adjective that Dawkins used is philicidal. Is God philicidal? I'm guessing, I didn't read his book, but I'm guessing that's a reference to when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Remember that? And so Abraham follows through. And why would God do this? Well, he did it for two reasons. One, he wanted to test Abraham and to make sure Abraham was all in. And then two, he wanted to do this to foreshadow the cross. Because you know what? He used a lamb to replace Isaac for that sacrifice. And then, on that same little mountain range, if you will, that Mount Moriah is on, is where Calvary is. And the Lamb of God himself was sacrificed on that cross for you in me. God knew exactly what he was doing, right? He knew that, that Isaac wasn't going uh, to die that day. He, he knew that. Abraham didn't know that, but God did. Is God homophobic? Well, phobia, phobic, means that uh, we're afraid, but it has morphed into this, wor this, this meaning where when we say homophobic, it means that we are afraid, or it means we're we hate or we, we have disdain for a certain group of people like homosexuals. And the last time I checked, God loved everyone and sent his son to die for heterosexuals and homosexuals. Now, in the Old Testament, it was clear that, that, that God wanted men to sleep with women and, and women with men because he's trying to build a creation and you can't build a creation with same-sex uh, activities. And the Bible has more to say about... Um, uh, homosexuality, but all types of uh, uh, sexual activity. And, and so, no, God is not homophobic. I mean, this, this is just, it's just silly to say, to even try to defend this, right? And then, maybe even sillier, is God racist? This is this one, I'll, this, this one is almost ridiculous. This is maybe the most ridiculous. He is creator of all, everyone is made in his, his image. And racism directly violates who God is. He loves everyone. What I think he uh, is talking about here is, you know, when Israel was commanded to drive out other cultures, I think that's where Dawkins says or believes that, uh, well, God must be racist. But, you know, such judgment was carried out only in response to people's sin, not because they were different or they looked different or they had a different skin pigmentation. Also, Israel was held to the same standard and often punished the same way. So God didn't show racial favoritism. And on top of that, Jesus was not white. Uh, by all accounts, Jesus was all, had olive-colored skin, more brown than white. I don't, um, I don't see God being racist. So we've shot down most of what Dawkins has, has said here. Um, and he, Dawkins, you know, reads this from a point of fiction. And if you don't believe in the New Testament, 
uh, or the Old Testament, maybe, maybe you might think that, that this God is just some character that is vindictive and bloodthirsty and genocidal and racist and infanticidal and, and all this stuff and megalomaniacal. But you have to see the mercy and love of God were still well known in Old Testament times. Remember Jonah? He was told to go to Assyria for the Ninevites. Why didn't Jonah want to go? He didn't want to go mainly because he didn't think that they deserved grace and mercy and forgiveness, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what God gave them is another chance. He gave them mercy and grace. And then, of course, the New Testament we see God's love and we see we we see the story unfolding in a in a bigger picture of what was happening from Genesis 1 all the way into the passion narrative and resurrection day so Richard Dawkins is completely completely off base and I love what Christian author Paul Copan says in his book, Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament. He wrote that book partially, um, I believe, Copan wrote that book partially uh, to, to, um, to put down uh, Dawkins' claims. And this is what he says. And I, I, I love this, and I'm going to quote him because I can't say it any better. He says, the scriptures begin with the creational affirmation that all humans are made in God's image. In many ways, the improvements of the Old Testament over a good deal of other ancient Near Eastern legislation were a significant move toward that ideal. The Old Testament provides us with enduring perspectives about human dignity and fallenness not to mention moral insights regarding justice and faithfulness, mercy, generosity, and the like. He continues, While we may stumble or be troubled when reading certain Old Testament texts, we can put them in proper perspective by looking in the right places. The ultimate resolution is found in God's clarifying word to us one who became flesh and lived among us, who died and rose again on our behalf. And I love this last sentence that he writes, the God whom the new atheists consider a monster. The God whom the new atheists consider a monster is not just a holy God to be reckoned with, but a loving self-sacrificing God who invites us to be reconciled. He's not just a holy God to be reckoned with, but a loving, self-sacrificing God who invites us to be reconciled. To him. Friends, we worship an amazing God, but we have to understand that there are people out there who, and they're, they're free to believe what they believe, but we, we are going to be, we're going to be faced with people who will repeat some of Dawkins' claims. And we have to be ready to defend the Christian faith. And by defend the Christian faith, I don't mean to be ugly, you know, we're, we don't have to be ugly. We just have to know what we believe and say it with grace and truth. Speak in, uh, tr with gr grace and truth and truth with grace. Because there are people that we know who are struggling with the Christian faith precisely because of some of the things that Dawkins has put forth. And I just pick on Dawkins because his quote uh, really encompasses a lot of what the atheistic and agnostic community and those even hostile to the Christian faith believe. So now we will be better prepared. Now, I will make this offer to you as well. If you want a copy of my manuscript today, just just email me, um, email me, uh, 
or text me because I, 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 if you tell me, I'm going to forget. Um, so I can uh, email those to you. Um, and so, because uh, I didn't leave a, a spot in your bulletin for notes today, I, I apologize for that, but there wasn't, uh, this really wasn't a sermon that um, you could really take notes in because it was just a lot of information uh, jam-packed there. But uh, we're going to be tackling more of these. I hope this helped. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a loving God. And we know because you're loving that you have to be just and that you have to make judgments. And Lord, we thank you that you are a perfect God. Despite what is out there, despite the growing communities who believe in that the Bible is fiction and that that, that, that you are what, what Dawkins characterizes you are, we know much better, God, and we thank you. For anyone in here struggling today, Lord, uh, with, with their faith or with doubts, Lord, let, let, this, um, let this serve as a, a point to jump forward back into um, solid ground and not the sinking sand of doubt. We thank you, Lord, for your timeless word. And we thank you for your love and forgiveness, mercy and grace, and your justice. We pray all this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Well, friends, let us stand and say what we believe today with the help of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen.
Amen. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, what a day it was. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Um, next week, one, one service, remember, and invite a friend, neighbor, relative, uh, stranger, enemy, whoever. Invite them. Uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a great service uh, next uh, next Sunday. So uh, it's a chance to grow our church, and we hope that uh, that you'll be there. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your timeless Word. We thank you, Lord, that you equip us with with all kinds of theological knowledge in order to uh, not only keep the faith but strengthen our faith. Let us go out in this world and show, show who you really are with, our, with, with a disposition of grace and mercy and love for all those who we come in contact with. We pray all of this in Jesus' most holy name.